to the Over 80 Minutes podcast season two. We're back again after our great guest last week. We've come back with another Scottish international representative. She is the owner of Strong Friends Club, soon to be a World Cup representative. Like I said, Scotland international, possibly the most positive person I've ever had the pleasure of following on social media. Christine Belial, more commonly known as CB. How are you? I'm good. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. I hope Hannah Smith, Rona Lloyd and Sarah Bonds didn't scare you too much. Nah, only only good things were said, so I'm excited to be here. Good, and just to put this off, this is an Emma Wassel slander-free zone after the last two sessions of Under the Team Bus. Yeah, I did hear that, and I've got some other things up my sleeve, so I'm excited. <laughs> I like that, it's good. That means I can tag somebody else. Exactly. I felt bad, I felt yeah. bad putting Emma Wassel on the tag of everything. Was, I'm sure she didn't mind. Cool? Any publicity is good publicity, so I'm sure she didn't mind. Yeah, you're talking like a true podcaster now. As long as you're tagged, it's good. Exactly. So, before we get started, the most important question I always like to ask people, how is everything going in life just now? Winning? Yeah, honestly, can't complain. Um, back in Glasgow now, just drove from Loughborough today, so it's nice to be like in my home home, um, had some Nando's for dinner, actually unpacked my stuff. So, overall, can't complain. Really happy. Yeah, you've answered the key question. Every time I'm talking to somebody, if my go-to is, so what did you have for tea? So you've answered that right off the bat. Easy. See, I already knew. Ahead of you. What are we talking? Are we double wrap or are we like half chicken? No, today was the four chicken thighs because I didn't, I had um, a wrap in Loughborough yesterday. So I was kind of over it and I wanted to mix. So two day Nando's, that's strong. That's a stupid diet. No, I wasn't right Nando's yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't complain, but it wasn't Nando's yesterday. It's actually like homemade stuff, so. Oh, even better yeah a fake nando's when you get the spice packets at home just exactly not the same because <laughs> it doesn't taste the same when someone else doesn't make it for you but still good so very true nothing tastes better than food you've not had to put any effort in for exactly <laughs> well cb as you probably know we're going to get started with the usual the quick fires this is just where we see how quirky your brain is and what you answer differently compared to everybody else and then the many many thousands of fans can judge on how you respond yeah all five of my family members that listen to this podcast yeah. me yeah. me twice as well i'm included me as well so it's like runs up yeah. to a oh, that's half, so half the listeners in this one call amazing <laughs> right simple tea or coffee uh have to be coffee i think amazing i kind of guessed that but i didn't want to judge some stereotypes so mm. tim hortons is that is that still the go to do you miss tim hortons not no really not at all like i think tim hortons gets like such a rep here because it's like the canadian thing but like back home it's like kind of like crap coffee i wouldn't really oh. go there for coffee if that's maybe controversial I, but <laughs> i was i was close to like illegally smuggling substances with the amount of timbits i tried to bring back from vancouver and it's, no timbits are different but the coffee is like nothing to write home about <laughs> but like yeah i could go there and smash like 20 timbits into my face that's easy so oh, yeah. whoever thought we just want the middle of the donut that they've pushed out and just will have that yeah exactly that's the best part <laughs> I can't believe it. I said to my friend for, who lives in Canada, I was like, he was like, I bet you five minutes before you talk about Timbits, and I think I broke it. We gave it on four minute marks. <laughs> it's <laughs> right, so back, <laughs> it's, everybody likes Timbits. No, yeah. the coffee, you just get the coffee because you're there. You need something to wash the Timbits down. 100%. Right, back to the quick fires. Night out or a night in? Honestly, that depends. I think if you asked me two weeks ago, I would have said night out. But after our night out two weeks ago, now I only want night in. <laughs> I, oh God. It also depends on the weather. But like, because if it's cold, which it always is, cold and rainy, then I maybe would stay in. But honestly, probably night out. I do like to go have fun. Everybody should. I, I did see a few photos of you with a few glasses of Prosecco at the Murrayfield, at Murrayfield the other week. That wasn't me. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> That's Photoshop. That was, that yeah, was just that somebody was else like framed. Yeah, framed. Yeah. <laughs> so following on from night out or night in, if you're on a night out, is it day drinking or do you like a proper nightclub pub till the early hours I of the morning? I love day drinking. Like sign me up for 1 p.m. lunch <laughs> in bed by like 9 or 10 p.m. I mean, that's always the idea, right? Like that you'll go yeah. home and go to bed at like a reasonable time. But I also don't know how to press the brakes. So what... <laughs> <laughs> what the plan is and what actually happens never usually marry but yeah i i do love day drinking it's probably one of my favorites i love the thought of people trying to temper you down by going so you've got to be at the restaurant for like quarter to 12 midday and then at half eight they're like oh i should probably go down and you're like actually i think the pubs just opened over there so we can go <laughs> yeah and also like an espresso martini can really change the whole night you know so <laughs> it's, it's a dangerous game you're playing with fire 
you and I speak the same language. If you're starting to feel tired, two espresso martinis and you're ready to go. 100%, yeah. Right, a controversial one now. If you had to get rid of one tomorrow, would you get rid of rugby or would you get rid of dogs? <sighs> That's so hard. I don't want to answer. I don't want to answer. <laughs> you have um, to answer one. Uh, just the sport? Yeah, rug as in rugby never existed. Oh my god, that's so hard. Because I obviously have a dog. <laughs> that's like the that's probably the hardest question I've been asked in a long time. That's so silly. Because obviously, like rugby is like where like where my life is. It's what has provided me with so many opportunities. And but then also I have a dog, and she's an absolute angel. And I can't imagine like her just not existing. But I guess rugby probably would offer me more in life than dogs. So I'm going to have to say dogs, even though that literally makes me feel like Ooh. I know, I know. But like, if I, I'm, I may be overthinking it, but like. You're a monster. I know. <laughs> hey, if that made you feel any better, Rona Lloyd said she'd get rid of dogs as well. And she got judged harshly. She was almost booed out of the room by Sarah Bonds when she was on that podcast. Oh, yeah, I believe it. At least I've got someone on my side. Then I can just message Rona about this later. Yeah. When it's just you two playing rugby and everybody else is with the dogs, you're like, well, who's the winners now? Oh, true. We... <laughs> I can't keep up with Rona. <laughs> you can you can do bleep tests while the others just cuddle puppies. And that's that's what you signed up yeah. for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. Like, if it was just the sport, like, I could probably live without, like, watching or playing. But mm -hmm. obviously, like, rugby is much greater than that for me. It's, like, my whole community. It's where I, yeah. like, created, like, and if I didn't have it, then I wouldn't have had all of those things. So am I overthinking it? Maybe, but here we are. So I, I like it. People, most people just fly off the bat and you've just got, mm. no, there's a proper serious thought pattern to this. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Right. If you're going to sit down to watch TV, are you more likely to watch movie or TV series? TV series, 100%. I cannot get through a movie. I need character development. So <laughs> movies for me, I have a really hard time caring about. So yeah. that's, yeah. You want that 13 hours of straight TV that was meant to be a week long and it's I've well, finished it. <laughs> I think like I just like I honestly don't even watch that many like new TV series. Like I stick to a lot of what I know. Um <laughs> and because like because I don't sit down and watch TV that frequently, it's like I want to know that when I do sit down, I'm gonna like what I'm watching. So like I've seen the American Office over to ten times probably over the last like however many years. But it's so good. So I know that every time I put it on, even if I don't like pay attention to it, it's still like, I'm not wasting my time. Whereas sometimes you put on a movie and you're like, when is this going to get good? And it never does. And that's an hour and a half of your time wasted. True. Have you got to that stage now where you can watch it in the background and the speech, you can hear that there's a good joke from previous coming up and you can sort of tune back in? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's true. I'm on, I'm watching Suits for the second time right now and I've forgotten how good it was. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's just one of those things that like, it almost is like comfort where it's like, um, like background noise, you know, yeah. you don't like if I'm working or something, or if I'm like, writing something, and I don't want complete silence, like sometimes I don't want to have music on, but just having like chatter of other bits, like that's yeah. what I would usually pick. So white noise, weird yeah. white noise. Yes. Right, game of rugby. Do you want to play it in the scorching heat? Or do you want to play it in the soaking rain? <sighs> well, I've done both. <laughs> and I reckon soaking rain. Yeah. Yeah, because, As a front row. yeah, oh my gosh, when we went to Italy and played our first match there for like the first like round of qualifiers, we kicked off at 3 p.m. I have never been so hot. And like I've played rugby in Canada in the summer when it's like 30 degrees and humid. Like maybe I just like blacked that out of my brain, but this was like next level. I couldn't breathe. It was like choosing between talking or breathing. Yeah. So the pitch was like silent. And I, <laughs> I remember like in the warm up being like, my legs feel like they've already been drained of every part of <laughs> anything they have to offer doesn't exist. Like, you know, that feeling you get to like 60 or 70 minutes and you're like, okay, I'm tired, like cramping, can't move. Like that was happening in the warm up. Yeah. Um, whereas like, obviously the rain is like kind of crap, but at least like you can usually just endure it. No, that's exactly. I I definitely would prefer it. Plus, you get the scrum hugs when it's cold. Yeah, you get the nice warmth of a scrum. Yeah, I th I don't think forwards ever get cold. You know what I mean? Like I'm never complaining whether it's <laughs> like because I'm always in the heat of it all, like lifting people, mauling, right? Whereas like the backs obviously have to stop and wait for us to do set piece stuff. 
that's where they get cold. Whereas like that's not an issue for me, so I don't care. Oh no, you've you've clearly you've clearly never played hoik at school level on a Saturday morning. They so made us. I have not. <laughs> oh, hoik on a school morning. Hoik. The, I remember we once went to go play hoik at a school level, and the ground. You know, when your studs don't even go in because the frost is that. Yeah, hard. yeah. We're it was. Like, I I knew what it felt like to walk on three inch heels for a while, <laughs> and I was just like, this is not sitting. Like the yeah. hoik, they're just made differently. They were there, shorts, t-shirts. Coach wasn't even playing. He was in short and a t-shirt. And he was like, "Come on, guys, game's gone." We're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is mild like yeah. I don't know what you're yeah. we're built for this yeah yeah Oof, what's next radio or playlist on a car journey just straight back up from Loughborough what were you choosing playlist yeah although sometimes yeah. I'll do like song radio so I'll pick like a song that I want and then it obviously gives you like similar kind of genres if I want to listen to songs that maybe I don't have saved but usually always playlist I do I do like a wee your daily recommendations on Spotify that normally goes down well yeah the problem is they then just end up going on the like song playlist anyway, so it just fats with them as well. Yeah. Uh, if you're trying to relax, so not to get clean, but trying to properly relax, would you bath or shower? Um, Probably bath. Okay. Bath yeah. and candles are the way. Yeah. And like Epsom salts. Is it like I, I've only recently moved, well, I guess I've lived in this flat for the last year, but before that I lived in my old flat for like five years and it didn't have a bath. Um. So I mean, we discovered, yeah. So obviously like, especially after like a training session or whatever, and I know you said to relax, but like even just after training session, like Epsom salts and like hot bath, I'm like, this yeah. is a game changer and you sleep so well after. So definitely bath. No, I agree. Like out, like out of the kettle, hot water, like this is- Oh yeah, like it hurts you to get yeah. in. Like you're like trying to put your feet in and you're like, ha ha. But like yeah. when you're in there, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I can appreciate that. I never go anywhere without a candle. Yankee candles are always on the go. Oh, see, candles. Just, they just make the, it's your scent. I've, I've got beach escape on it, and I think yeah, I bought this candle yesterday, and I'm halfway through. Mine's spice berries and apple, but I kind of have a cold right now, so I can't actually smell anything. I have COVID tested, full disclaimer. <laughs> I, am, I am fully negative, but, like, I have the flu, so, like, I can't smell it. But it looks really nice, so. It's a good thing about audio podcasts. I don't yeah. have to COVID test. It's the biggest saving grace. Yeah, yeah. Also, <laughs> but just for the people out there, if you're listening, I am negative. Please don't panic. Right, in case when this goes out in however many weeks and somebody sees you walking down the street, they'll be like, oh, I heard she couldn't smell on that podcast yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, the rules might have changed by then. It might be if you have COVID, you have to go outside. Who knows? That's how it is in England now, hey? It's like they've yeah. completely changed it. It's like, like the Wild West down there. It's, I was down there for a charity football game last summer, and people looked like looked at me like I was a weirdo for wearing a mask because mm. they were just they were just raw dogging it everywhere. It just yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it is. I remember when I first got down there in October, like to start playing for Loughborough, and like going to shops, and like no one was wearing masks at all, and like I it just felt so foreign. As soon as you like crossed over, and I went into like a service station, I was mm -hmm. like, I now I'm the odd one out. Like this is so strange, but. I don't know. It just is we, what it is, I guess. I was I was on the train, so I came back for your train, and I was on and like I swear every man and his dog from Manchester decided to come to Scotland for a holiday. So this mm -hmm. train was packed and no masks. And as we crossed the border, a guy walked down the train and went, Can you all put your masks on when we're out in Scotland? And I was just kind Yay! of looking, I was like, What's the point? <laughs> yeah, like, people, yeah. People, like, I've, I've I've had a mask on, but there's been people on this train for two hours without a mask on. <laughs> yeah, I've literally been like coughing into each other's faces. But I've been having a conversation with this random not... dude and his family for an hour yeah no that's gonna be the difference obviously that one mask change yeah that's save lives mm. <laughs> god i was just stuck in a big head if you talk about myself but... yeah right you're trying to get a night out sorted are you more likely to call facetime or text it depends on who with because the some gals people... gal gang but gal gang it kind of depends <laughs> though because some of them you can text and get an answer others you have to facetime to get an answer <laughs> To get people's attention, but probably text. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna add an extra question to the end of the team bus section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who doesn't who doesn't answer when you text? Them? Right. The controversial question from season one: Do you prefer bourbons or custard creams? And if you don't know what they are, I'll explain them to you. Um, I think bourbons. You're on the Christmas card list. Yeah. Custard custard Those creams. Those are the chocolate are, ones, right? Yeah. Chocolate yeah. like chocolate creamy in the middle with the. Yeah. Yeah, you're sure. on the Christmas card list. Custard creams for posh people. Don't deal with it. Yeah. Socks and or, socks and or if I could have if I could have another option, dark chocolate digestives. 
I could smash with six of those in a row easily. Really? Yes. Do you dunk them in? Do you dunk them in tea? Mm-mm. Nope. Just like no. one after the other. Like you open Pure. the pack, like oh, I'm <laughs> one, and it'll take two to the couch. But the next thing you know, the two that you're gonna have on the couch, you've already eaten. Just go. And and carry. Just, it's like a conveyor belt. Like I don't think I ever fully swallow one before I already have another full one in my mouth. Yeah, so I can't buy them that frequently because I'm a monster. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just a desperate cry for help about a dark chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Like. So if anyone knows anyone that can help me, I have an addiction. And so I if any, yeah. So if anybody sees CV in a in a COVID-free zone when she's not, and she can smell, and she see her with dark chocolate digestion, just slap them out of her hat. Exactly. Please <laughs> do me a favor. We've got a World Cup to win, guys. Yeah. So you, you can, next time you have dark chocolate digestion is when we win the World Cup. That's the, I already have some in my cupboard. Cup. So I love that you think that. <laughs> but when this is over, I'm going to have some. Good. It's quite right. Yeah. <laughs> if you, tell you what, if you win the World Cup, I'll buy you a pack of dark chocolate digestion. That is my promise. Running. Okay, easy. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I owe Hannah Smith a, a Thai curry as well, so I'll have to hope she's forgotten about that by then but i don't think she will no it's special it's a very renowned one as well everybody goes on and she's never been yeah <laughs> right socks and sliders are they acceptable yes or no yeah i'm down although i'm more of a croc kind of gal but i'll go I need, I need to get on this croc hype i've not got a bear and i need to yeah. get on this croc hype yeah from this i got i got a big boy job now i work in an office i can't wear crocs to the office anymore mm, agree to uh, disagree <laughs> Trust me, I'd say, hi, expensive client. How are you? Yes, these are my crocs. It's called fashion, honey. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah. Like yeah. Crocs and shorts as well. Just yeah. no no formality whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> What's your go-to musical CV? My go-to musical? That's a weird question. I don't really watch a lot of musicals, but the first one that popped into my head was Chicago. I can't imagine you not being a musicals fan, you know? Ah, yeah, not really. Like... You break the mold. I, I associate a lot of positivity with musicals, so that's no, weird, not for me. Like I, but yeah, I think, I mean, again, because I've not seen that many, and I think Chicago is a bit different. Like obviously, it is a musical, but it's kind of dark. I mm. quite like that. That'll be you my like bit, bit of a mood, a bit of drama. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh well, I'll have to give you a list of musicals to watch because there's so many you're missing out on. Okay, you must well, have seen the greatest showman. Well, you know? I promise you that I'm going to watch them, but well, I'll still take a list. I've done my part. <laughs> yeah. I'm, spread, I'm spreading the good word of the the sun word, I suppose, is the way I describe that. I, yeah. I've sent you a list of movies that you probably won't watch, but there we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least I have it for a reason. Yeah, exactly. yeah. You can only you can only control what you can control, and that's why. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Popcorn, sweet or solid? Both together. I want sweet and salted together. That they make that as an option, <laughs> so Check I cancel down. your question. And that's that was I... that was that was the quickest quick fire question ever. Sweet or salted, yeah. both. Yeah. Is right. Is it acceptable to drink a cold cup of tea that you've left out and forgotten about? Um, I think unless you have a newborn baby, then no. No. <laughs> like, yeah, no. Yeah, you're gonna fall out with me, mm. mainly because I do it. What's your favorite bit of? Yeah, Scotland stash you've ever got to keep or worn? Mm, probably more recently, our winter jackets are quite nice, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, my the first shirt that I got to start in, my three shirt, was probably, mm-hmm. I don't know if that counts as stash, but like that's probably been my favorite. Yeah, that counts as stash. Yeah, and probably like the, the shirt that I got my first start in is probably my favorite. Good that's, that's probably the best answer you can give. That's a yeah. very good answer. Yeah. Right. And last but not least, if you could swap jerseys with any player, whose jersey would you want? Ooh. So like, at the end of the game when everybody's swapping shirts. That's a good question. From any team. Yeah, anybody ever. Any rugby player ever. Hmm. That's a really good question. That's the only one that I've got, so let's hold on to this one for a while. Yeah, no, can we come back to it? Can I think about it for a minute? Yeah, of course. In that case, while we're going, we'll get started. So we've done done the quick fires, easy as simple as that. So I want to go back to the very beginning. Let's talk about young CV. What was life growing up in Canada? How is rugby in Canada? Yeah, it's really good. It's like, um, I was very fortunate to have opportunity to start when I was quite young. Um, but I didn't start, so I started playing in high school Um, but when you get to high school in grade nine, that's when you can start. And I didn't start until grade 10 because I was still like super shy, didn't want to play team sports. Like 
I'm very competitive, but I, when I was younger, I didn't recognize that and being competitive and anxious didn't really marry well together when I didn't recognize those traits in myself. Um, so I first grew up, um, figure skating and horseback riding. So I was like a very individual athlete. And then when I got to high school and all my friends started playing rugby, I didn't start the first year cause I didn't want to be bad at it. I think is probably the biggest thing is mm -hmm. now like looking back, obviously as an adult with hindsight, like I think the thing that honestly did hold me back was because I didn't want to be bad at it, but all of my friends had never played before, but because I was so anxious about it, I couldn't do it. Like I just couldn't yeah. do it. Um, and then the next year, my rugby team or like my high school was going on a tour to Ireland and mm -hmm. you obviously had to play to go on the tour and I wanted to go on the tour. So I started playing and, <laughs> and it was good. So, and then like, I just, it fit okay. me. Yeah. It fit <laughs> me a lot better that like contact sports are made for me. Like I'm made for contact sports. I've always been like big, tall, strong, um, and not very graceful. So shifting from something like competitive synchronized figure skating to a contact sport, it was like a much better fit <laughs> for who I am. I can't imagine competitive synchronized figure skating. That's like they those seem like one of those sports that seems very dra like draining on the body. Competitive I, figure skating seems it, impossible. Yeah, it, I mean, I have not I've not put skates on in years now, and I imagine I could still do it because. As like, I said, do you think you still give it a good go? Yeah, I do. I honestly do. Like, it might take a little bit of like warming up, but like, I think it's one of the things that you don't lose, like riding a bike, because I started skating when I was like four. You know, in Canada, you genuinely learn how to skate the same time that you're learning how to walk. So, um, like, that's not even like a stereotype. Like, that's legit. So, I don't think I'd lose how to skate. I would maybe be more conservative in trying things, but that's just, I think, because I'm like older now and I definitely have this like, higher awareness of injury you know when you're a kid you're like no, i'm not scared of anything whereas like now i'm like oh, i don't have to tear an acl <laughs> so i'm scared of everything um yeah so it's been a journey but rugby's definitely been like the best suited thing for me i think i think so how did you get into horseback riding and skating at the same time <laughs> so you said you learned to skate when you were four years old when you say yeah. when you say you're a horseback rider, is this like show jumping or equestrian, or was this like yeah? So I started riding sport? when I was like five as well, yeah. and I think part of it was childcare. Like there was a barn where, so I lived like more in the country. Um, you, you're Calgary Middle, are you not Alberta? No, I'm like Peterborough, so it's just east of Toronto. But oh, I actually yeah. start like I grew up in a place called Keene, which is even smaller than Peterborough, um, and it was like 20 minutes from like the barn it's called stillborn stables i should give them a shout out because legit they yeah. like janine the like, yeah. if, she, if she yeah if she if she ends up listening to this like janine stillman is like a huge um like person in my life who helped me kind of come out of my shell more but um yeah i think part of it was child care especially in the summer both my parents were like fully employed like my mom was a police officer for like 33 years my dad was like the general manager of an ice hockey arena, which is like the most Canadian thing of all time. But they both worked all the time. They didn't have that many holidays. So um, Janine had this like farm where she would, I think she had at first, maybe honestly, like a handful of us would take us in like for the weekdays and riding was just something to keep us busy and tire us out because otherwise you have like five kids under the age of 10, you're going to run riot. So that's kind of where I started. And then I started like taking private lessons. Um, and then that's when I, I started like competing as well. So it was like show jumping and that kind of stuff. Um, it wasn't at a high level in any means because of where I lived, like that kind of elite level show option mm -hmm. weren't there, but it was still, it was pretty legit. Like you still like wore the blazers, you still like did all the braiding. Like it, it did teach me like a lot of discipline and responsibility and that kind of stuff. Um, and it just like kind of allowed me like a safe space to be active and do things without like feeling super uncomfortable. Because again, like as a kid, I was not who you would think I am now. Like now I never shut up example a, but like as a kid, like I like 
was so anxious to talk to anybody. It was crazy. Like I wouldn't even recognize myself. So that was like a very important time for me as a kid because I got to be active and do stuff, but like didn't nervous about it. I think that's I think that's also just a great advert for team sport in general of how it can help people. Mm. If you in a place where you think, oh no, everybody's gonna be looking at me and if I'm not doing it right, and there's people that just go, Well, you're one of us now, so yeah, we might be able to make fun of you, but if anybody else has a bad word about you, not a chance we're letting that slide. So Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think once I started playing rugby, like that's that is genuinely what helped me come out of my skin or like out of my shell more. Um and helped me kind of understand like what being competitive was all about like and being okay with being competitive and like yeah just having other people kind of cheer you on and push you to be better it was yeah I think team sport is super important and you're absolutely right like once you become a part of a team like everybody rips on each other but it is that safe space where like if anybody like an outsider has anything to say like you've got 30 of your closest friends ready to rumble if they need to. <laughs> Maybe never to say about what about you guys in the night out? You got 30 people there. It's big. <laughs> How does, um, so you, everybody, you, you've probably heard a lot of this yourself when people go, oh my God, you're a rugby player. That's so brave. I can think of nothing braver than somebody being willing to sit on a horse and trust it to help you compete in a sport. I guess like, but for me, I mean, because as I grew up, I also worked at a summer camp. And I, the, so then I was teaching lessons. Yeah. Um, and I mean, because I grew up in that environment, I'm not nervous around horses as well I, at all. Sorry. And like, I understand them more like every horse has, I mean, no one ever, also anyone listening to this is like, we didn't sign up for this. We signed up for rugby, but <laughs> anyone who has been around horses before will tell you that like each individual thing one has its own personality and how it behaves and they're often used as like therapy animals as well so they're very good at like feeling your energy and that's why they're good for um people with disabilities and young kids and stuff as well because like they genuinely do feed off of that and some of them are absolute dicks like i've had horses where i've had to punch them in the face before because like they've tried to throw off my like six-year-old student but like for the most part they're really like gentle and know that they just have a job to do but like when i would have like hockey boys come or like other adults come who've never been around horses before i fully understand what you're saying they'd be like oh like it's like immediate like fear and i'm like it's because i've been in that environment they're not scary to me at all but like it's funny to watch that happen <laughs> it's like an absolute like recoil into a shell like so nervous on this horse like don't know what to do but um i guess because i grew up in that environment like it's never been scary for me see i was i used to be scared of horses when i was younger because we have a lot of fields around here with people who own horses so we used to do that we'd feed them like a carrot from the safety of the other side of the fence yeah and i was like oh no these guys aren't too bad and then i had ryan manny on here who's a grand national winning jockey he won the national he's from my local area and he was like no i'm terrified of horses i was like you race horses and, he's like, and i'm terrified of every single one i was like that's <laughs> crazy yeah <laughs> like, but like race horses are different like race horses are psychotic <laughs> so i understand because those guys are not cool but like lesson horses some show jumping horses like the horses that i worked with were also like old for the most part or like just they were less than horses like they were made for young kids so um yeah whereas like yeah race horses are mean yeah they're, they're professionals they don't they exactly. to do a job. yeah this isn't exactly. no, that legit is it for sure if any, I, I reckon if a horse could understand the amount of money they're probably going on top of them every single race i'd be pretty nervous too i bet you like <laughs> some of those horses do know because they walk around like they own the whole thing <laughs> like, Fairness, they uh, do, to be fair <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely true absolutely true I know. It's very often I've looked at horses and gone, I reckon that thing's probably worth more than me, like as a it person. Is. <laughs> and the answer is it is. Like when I this was years ago when I worked at the summer camp, one of the owners of the camp, or like her husband, he used to play in the NHL and then like got a bunch of concussions and couldn't play anymore. So started investing in racehorses. And I remember one year they came home with a new horse and they had bought it for like eighty grand. And then, like, the next weekend, it won, like, 100 grand in a race. And I was like, nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Nice, yeah. <laughs> like, cool, 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 cool. That's yeah. more than anything that I own right now. To be fair, I was 16. But, like, still, <laughs> that's mental. I mean, I'm 20. I'm, I keep saying I'm 26. I'm not. I'm 25. I'm almost 26. So 
my girlfriend's drummed into me that I'm almost 26 and now it's just living with me but I don't yeah. think I've got anything worth 100 grand on 26 so yeah. 10 years on <laughs> yeah so rugby rugby in Canada what's the scene like for because I know even the scene over here as much as it's growing the scene for women's rugby isn't that big yeah just now I'm gonna put that in very commas because shout out TikTok they've taken yeah. six nations on board mm. um how's the scene in Canada for women's rugby is it sparse and divided or is it is it growing because I know America actually do women's sport a lot better than men's sport um that's a good question I can only answer from my experience from when I was there like I've lived in Scotland for almost seven years now so I'm sure from when I was there it has grown but while I was there I yeah what was it like while you was there yeah yeah, while I was there I had I felt like I had good opportunity to be competitive like I played all through high school there was a competitive club team that I had. I had opportunity to go to provincial tryouts, which then would have allowed me to go through like a pathway to play for Canada. Had I like chosen that path and trialed well enough or whatever. Um, but I do think when you compare my experience from when I was a kid to now going into schools, cause I've gone in um, with, like some camps and stuff into schools to teach kids rugby because obviously here it feels like the only option that a lot of kids have going into school is football or netball um Mm -hmm. so that's just not like it's completely different in canada like you go into high school in canada and you can play rugby lacrosse field hockey ice hockey um like you can do curling if you want like the range of sport you can try is much more grand and then the access to actually having like competitive pathways is also there so um it made it much easier for me to be challenged and find the right group because there was so many different levels within the club as well like we had first teams second teams and third teams when i was like under 18s so you had girl yeah so it was much greater than what it is here well, it just sounds like we need to step it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is growing. It is definitely growing. Like when I, like obviously Cartha was my first club here and it still is like one of my most favorite places. Um, but they've done a huge amount of work to get more numbers in. Like they're the first team in Scotland that have, that can consistently field to women's teams, like competitively. Yeah. Um, the under 18s and like futures programs there are, like they've got the most numbers. And so obviously they are doing something right. I think it's just, it does take time. And I think the biggest thing to continue to help that grow is like having more visibility for the women's game. Because when young girls see older girls doing something that shows them that they can do it too. Like when you only see men playing sport, you don't think that that's an option for you. So obviously having our game have way more visibility and being more accessible through social media and knowing that there are younger girls who are following your channels, like that helps grow our game because we become examples of what you can do. So I think it, like, it is definitely growing. It just is one of those things that with all women's sport takes a bit of time. Mm-hmm. No, well, it's like, like you said, it's definitely growing and it's always on the up. And then do you get a lot of these, you know, like you said, you get a lot of young female athletes that can see it. Do you get, have you found you're getting more of these sort of DMs where it's, hey, I'm a young girl wanting to try rugby. What's the steps I did to get into this kind of? Um, I wouldn't say that I get that many like DMs, um, but within like Strong Friends Club, I work with a couple girls. Well, I actually work with quite a few girls who play rugby, some just for their clubs and are looking to get fitter and stronger and be able to like feel good for 80 minutes. And then I do have a couple girls who have been aiming for Scottish futures. And one actually just recently has been selected, which is super exciting. Um, oh, so, yeah, like, it's Shout a, out you. Shout out you. Her name is Lindsay McDermott. Um, and so she's like, just in the startup of it, she's, but she's been working her butt off for over a year. Like, and I would love to take any credit, but it's like her doing the hard work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you want to see her, come and ask questions and that's the thing the, that's been the coolest thing because everybody that works with me in my program like within strong friends club they all have different goals and things that they want to achieve but her case has been like something that i kind of hold a little bit dearer to my heart because it's been like i've been through what she's going through like trying to mm-hmm. get selected and come down a pathway and 
you know, you put your hand up that you want to compete and you want to try to get to the highest level. So she's been putting the work and we, whenever we have phone calls and we chat about it, it's not just about like her training programs or her nutrition or how we're going to kind of best manage her stress, whatever. It's also literally just like, we'll talk about scrums. We'll talk about like defense. We'll talk about the setup. We'll talk like, so it is really cool to see that happen. Um, but mm -hmm. in terms of like social media and stuff, I don't honestly get that many messages, but when I do, it's like, it's cool to have. Cause you don't think in the moment when you're posting something, you don't really think too Who's much. actually reading it on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is cool to see that you actually are like, hopefully positively influencing or impacting those brains. But mm -hmm. yeah, that must be, that must be such valuable information that you can have. Cause I mean, I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not trying to bash any online PT or anybody that does this here, but actually having when you go to an online PT who's actually trained in what you want to become good at must be so valuable because I remember we had a strength and conditioning coach and it, one of the first things he showed us was a photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger and a photo of um I, can't, I think it was a uh, Adam Jones it was the uh, the, the old Welsh prop with the big curly hair and beard and he was talking about it and he was like how many rugby games has Arnold Schwarzenegger ever won in his life and then you know technically zero we don't know what he did at high school he might have played a few but the, the common consensus is zero, like if you yeah. had to guesstimate. And it was Adam Jones, and it's like racked up over like 100 odd wins, 200 odd wins, stuff like that. And yeah. he's like, so why would you train to be like this guy if you're wanting to do what this guy does? Yeah. And then I think, so like you said, having somebody that once you're actually talking to about the fitness, that you can then go, oh, so this will help you in scrums, this will help you in rocks. Mm. Doing this will help your endurance for the 80 minutes, this will help you with flexibility and sprint speed, it must be so invaluable. Yeah, I, it's really cool. Like, and that I think is the biggest thing working with any females, especially, um, who play any sport is like redefining what training looks like for your goal. Because oftentimes I think people come in with goals of like looking a certain way, but then also play a sport. And obviously like you can definitely change what your body looks like, but what is your main priority? Like mm -hmm. if you want to be a performance athlete in any sport, then the focus has to be less on your aesthetic and more on how you perform. And if you, I mean, and that's why like anyone I work with, whether they're a performance athlete or not, if we do focus on like what you can do rather than what you look like, you're like, your body's going to change anyways. You know, mm -hmm. if you feel it the right way, you train it the right way, then it will change anyways, probably to what you want to see or better or what you didn't expect, you know, um, but you're going to enjoy the journey a lot more because you're less focused on like, I don't know, fitting into a pair of jeans in two weeks time. And instead you're able to do like 10 press ups. And then also along the way, your body has changed. So I think mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, it is very cool to be able to like, hopefully change the view of how we see exercise and fitness. Um, and obviously like being an athlete is, it makes it a lot easier because people know that I can't tell a lie because I've actually been through it, you know? Uh <laughs> You've inspired me. I'm I'm feeling very very motivated. If it wasn't yeah. pitch, if it wasn't pitch black outside now, I'd hit the I'd hit the tracks. But yeah, I bet, I bet. It's done. It's, I, I try. Yeah. <laughs> I like. I, I'm a victim. I have like birthdays back to back, so there's been a lot of cake in the house at the moment. So that's been my downfall. But that's okay. That's just fuel. Uh, you just use that for sessions. <laughs> Simple. Yes. Problem is when you don't take the car out of the garage, then it's not very good fuel. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway. Back to the the CB story journey. So fresh faced, you've packed in the horses, the skates have been hung up. You've now got a massive pair of front row boot cleats with eight inch studs. Yeah. You've, your journey's changing. You've got a bag of Timbits for the plane. You make your way over to Scotland. How did that feel when you were, how, what made your decision to move to Scotland and come across? And Well, I worked, so I didn't actually come over to Scotland to play rugby at all. I, mm -hmm. um, I had been obviously on a tour to Ireland, knew that I wanted to come back over here. I didn't know where I just knew that I wanted to come back. One of my friends, when I was working in the summer camp years later, he was from Glasgow and he was getting married. So he invited my friend and I over to his wedding. So we went and saw, we went to his wedding and then we backpacked around the UK for about two and a half months. And like Glasgow was always kind of where I would come back to as like the main hub. And the base, yeah. Yeah, it just kind of felt like home. Like I've always traveled around. I do love where I grew up. I obviously like value where I grew up so highly because it is where I became who I am. Um, but 
I always wanted to travel more. I always felt like I had like itchy feet is how I describe it. Like I would never be settled somewhere. Like I'd go and travel somewhere, stay for eight to 10 months and be like, okay, like, where am I going next? But Glasgow was like where I felt like home. Um, so went back to Canada after that little travel trip was able to get my Irish passport because my grandma was born in Dublin. So then about a year and a half later, I came back over here thinking like, I'll just live in Glasgow, um, work in whatever capacity that looks like probably hospitality. Cause at this point I hadn't gone to university yet. I was thinking like, I'll just obviously then like the UK and Europe are much more accessible because Ryanair makes flights much cheaper that like it's much easier to go to Italy from Glasgow than it is to go to Italy from Canada. Right. So yeah. I was thinking I'll just live and work. Um, my friend, the same friend had come over with me. Um, she was on a, like a visa for two years. And so after about the first like year and a half of being here and just working in restaurants, um, and, that kind of my existence, I was like, I need to broaden my horizons because if you've ever worked in hospitality before, you'll know that you're drinking as much as you're working. You're not really like living the best lifestyle. Like my mental health definitely wasn't in a great spot, but it like was only because I was literally working for 12 hours and then drinking a lot and then working at 10 AM. Like that was a vicious cycle of just like feeling like absolute garbage. So I was thinking I need to find friends that, um, are going to help me break that cycle and hopefully get me more active. So I just Googled rugby clubs in Glasgow. Cartha was the closest one. It was within walking distance. So that's where I ended up. And obviously like rugby clubs also have a as well. but it also meant that I was more active. So started playing there, um, and just settled in like, and it just became more of my life here. Like it made me feel like I actually was forming a community and forming a life here rather than just like being here working yeah. for life. I actually was like making friends that I knew I was going to see if they left the club. You know, a lot of times in jobs, you have work friends, not we like real friends. Whereas like within yeah. the club, like, I was actually like becoming a part of something. So that was a big thing for me. Oh, that's, that's class. You're talking to a six year hospitality vet here as well. I've done that. I've done the, the 3 a.m. drinking, knowing full well your shift starts at 11 a.m. the next day. Yeah, like not a said, good time. It can become a vicious cycle, that is. So. Yeah. You said, it's like you said, you do get some pretty strong friends out of that, but as you said, once you once you leave that job, they tend to disperse. <laughs> yeah. And then rugby friends, they always stay. Do you still get to visit Carthel a lot? Do you still get to go up and chat? I've not, I've not been in a while. Like, I would actually like to go back um, and see them soon. It's I had not been back for ages because when COVID hit and we were still training with the Scotland squad, we had to be so careful about crossing those bubbles. Um, and then I moved to Loughborough. So it's been wild to not go back and see everyone. I actually did go, I got to go back. My mom came to visit in November before we played Japan. And I actually went down to Kartha a few days before we went to camp and got to watch them play. Um, which was really good. So I was only there briefly and saw a few of the girls that I like played with, but I would like to go back for like, maybe not to run around in a session, but at least to like <laughs> say hi, <laughs> you know, just like see there for, there for touch rugby at the start. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've rolled my ankles on those pitches more times <laughs> than I'd like to admit. So I'll probably just like stand and watch, but um, yeah, I do love it. Yeah. One of those classic pitches that somehow has a hill in it, but it's still, it does, it has a legitimate <laughs> hill. That's the thing. Like you're saying that, but like it, anybody who's played at Carthen knows that it has a hill. It's ridiculous, but it's part of its charm. <laughs> <laughs> I know it makes it feel unique. Everybody has their own unique quality. Yeah. It's like ours, ours back home, for some, for some reason, somebody put the post right in front of a river. So every time somebody kicks a goal, the ball goes in the river. So, um, you know, like, you know, like the lifeguard nets yeah. they have. Yeah, like ours is the only rugby club that has three of those by the pitch ready for someone like and like a local amazing. volunteer has to go and fish the ball out every time that's amazing yeah, exactly part of scotland's trap if people wonder why rugby in scotland is that's because it's like that yeah the only, the only time flipping a coin to see which way you start actually matters because you think yeah. well, that's uphill so we want to do that first when we're still yeah. energy. <laughs> exactly exactly so we're going to move on to the bit now you've been here you've been with carter for a while talk to me about what it was like when scotland finally came knocking and they went you're pretty good at what you do, actually. Any chance you got some Scottish blood in there? We see the Irish passport. 
Yeah. We're kind of well, like Ireland but radio, you know? <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think, I don't think they came knocking on my door. I think I was kicking down their door first and making it very clear that I wanted to play. Um, so I, when I was playing at Cartha, there was a couple coaches there that were like, we should just see, like, if you're eligible to play for Scotland, would you want to? And I was like, well, yeah, like, I'm not going to say no. Like if I'm, I might as well just try if the opportunity is there and I can do it, then like, obviously that's an insane opportunity, but if you don't ask, you don't know. Um, and so one of the coaches was a development officer at the time, I think. And so he kind of put my name in the hat. Um, and so I got invited to a sevens camp because that was the only thing that they had going on in the summer. And it was just opportunity for the coaches there to kind of see what I was about. Like, it's not at that point even was was this while you were still playing center sorry to butt in was this when you were still playing center? i think i was playing back row at that time like right. i mean i'm definitely i like i was not a sevens player but they knew that like that was like my one saving grace going in was like right. i'm not trying to be a sevens player i'm, I'm here i'm here on rock that's all i'm here to do. Someone wants to... <laughs> <laughs> no but um i it was more just like to see i guess like my how I would work, like work ethic is a huge thing, right? Like I might not be sevens fit, but like, if I'm willing to throw up, <laughs> yeah. then maybe, you know, <laughs> so went, had a little trial. Um, the coaches said that obviously I had done a good job and think that I would be a good fit and it would be worth kind of investing more time in me. So then I got invited to some camps for the autumn. And then the week before I was supposed to go to my first camp, this was when shade was still the coach for the women. Um, I oh, ended yeah. up tearing my meniscus so I had to have surgery and so then I was out of training for like six or eight weeks so I missed like that whole kind of chunk um which was obviously really frustrating but then um after that I was still kind of like my name was kind of still in the hat because I hadn't done anything wrong right like yeah. I had yeah, I didn't pull out voluntarily. It was like I had an injury. So then we had a new coach come in and he brought me back in and um, I ended up being selected for the tour to South Africa. And that's where I got my first two caps. And that's when I was still playing like second row or back row. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where the whole like journey kicked off. And then I... I didn't really see that much time on the pitch until I started playing front row. So that's been like very transformational for me in terms of like the impact that I can have on the squad. But like my first season um, was huge because it, I was still being selected. So I was still a part of everything for like autumn tests and six nations, but I was often like 24th man. So I'd be with yeah. the squad, but I wouldn't be selected, which is like, it was obviously very frustrating and like very annoying. And sometimes you're on the bench and you don't get put on and, but that's like a part of performance sport. So it was kind of balancing, like being annoyed by that because you're a competitive person, you want to play and also recognizing like you have to kind of earn your stripes and you still have a role within that team. So regardless if you're playing or not, like there are so many other girls that would have wanted to be in my shoes where I was anyways. So I'm not going to sit there and be bitter about it. Like I still have opportunity to be getting better with every camp that I'm invited to. So um, the first year was a bit of like a roller coaster in terms of like being patient and being, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then I had some good talks with our coaches and our SNC coach thought that trying to move me into the front row would be worth a shot. And it turns out that it was, and here we are. So it's been a wild ride. <laughs> I think, how did you feel about getting out of the boiler house? Because I, I remember when I used to play, I used to be the one, I would always, if we needed a second row, like, I'll do it. But it was so begrudgingly the thought of going, the second row scares me for some reason. I don't, honestly, the second row. like at that point, I didn't care. Like I, the, the same reason I started playing front row was as soon as someone said to me, would you up for, like, would you be up for trying front row? Do you, like, would you play second row? Like, I, I just wanted to play. Like, I just wanted if to it, be if on, it gets the on the pitch. I'll do it, yeah. Legit, that was exactly my attitude. Like, I, when I was younger, I was, like, 16, and I had tried out for a provincial team in Canada, and I did not have the same attitude, and it definitely lost me opportunities. So now going into situations, like, as a more mature adult, I just knew, like, I'm not going to say no to anything because – at the end of the day, I just want to play rugby with my friends and like whatever that looks like, I don't care if the coaches are trusting me or think I can do something in some other role, then 
I'll try it. And the worst thing that's going to happen is it's not going to work. But then at least we know if you say no before you even try, then like you're just failing yourself. So um, yeah, I mean, I think I genuinely prefer front row to second row, but I mean, I don't care. I would just play anywhere. <laughs> you sound like you sound like the dream player for a coach where it's like, she's annoyed that she didn't get in the team. So she's going to try harder and she's going to push the other players. But she's so respectful of the fact that it's a team sport that she will not turn her back on the team and be like, oh, screw those guys. They're I mean, me. You're going to be there. Like, cheerleader number one, the second you're not player number three. I guess like that it's easy to like say that. And I guess that's like a really nice compliment. And But like, there were also times where I was definitely grumpy. You know what I mean? Like it's easy to paint the nicest picture, but like there were definitely selections that would go out that like I was not happy about and everybody knew about it for probably like half an hour. You know, you don't just sit there with a smile on your face. Like, I'm so glad that I don't get to play at all. Like you yeah. are angry and everybody can feel that energy coming off of you, but then you kind of have to have that conversation with yourself where it's like, well, this actually isn't about you at this time. So you have to get over it because you're either going to sit here and be miserable and everybody's going to feel it. And that's literally going to do nothing positive for you moving forward for selections, or you just take it on the chin and prepare everybody else to do their jobs. Because at the end of the day, like everybody here is still my friend and I want the team as a whole to do well. Um, so yeah, I guess like it is easy to look at it and be like, Oh wow, you're the best. <laughs> but like there were times where I was definitely like, you've got the Oscars acting face. Yeah. Right there were times when I was like, definitely like <laughs> have like a scrum session that I would try. So there's like these things in roundabouts. <laughs> yeah. It's like, guys, we're going like 50% today and you're just full scrummage. Machines like, moving yeah, backwards and forwards. We're like legit just like, yeah, not having a good time. But I mean, <laughs> that's like, that's the rugby as well. It's like all your team is going to understand the situation. So even if you're having kind of like a shit day, um, it's sort of understood, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure like, but like going back to my point, I still think even if they saw you were angry, I still think in the back of the mind, the coach goes, I'm quite glad she's angry about mm -hmm. it. Because you you never want like you never want complacency as, as far yeah. as I can understand. Totally, that's like the biggest thing that we talk about all the time is like being complacent is a disease. Like that's how no one moves forward. So, yeah, yeah. I guess that's a positive. <laughs> I think so. So that's fine. I'm, yeah, I have no sway with Brian and his team, but I <laughs> think it's <so>. yeah. <laughs> so. If you like, if just circle this and just timestamp it, and be like, I think you'll find Brian. <laughs> yeah. Sam's Sam's giving me the nod, so I will be starting 10 this week. He yeah. can go tell the girls to take I'm it down. I'm always trying to get him to play me at 10 as well, and he never <laughs> lets me. It's shocking. Just um, when, you're play, when you're playing like warm-up touch, just start throwing like missed threes and stuff like that. Just... Yeah, I'm always trying to put it on the toe, and he just yeah. hates that. I don't get it. <laughs> Yeah, let me live, Brian. Oh my do god. You, do you, did you get that at any point during the Columbia game when there was like, you know, when you'd had a few tries and you're just like, oh my god, I think no. I, th I think I think there's space in behind. <laughs> yeah, like no. because during that game I was like, I'm just I'm just here to do my job. Like, yeah, yeah I don't want to do anything crazy because even in the game, like we we're obviously up quite a bit quite early, but even coming out, I spoke to Rona about this afterwards and like. Even like even after halftime, we're like 16 minutes in. I was like, I still didn't feel like I could like fully relax yeah. until we were like 75 minutes. Because although it was clear that we had won the game, it's just that we, especially with our squad and the way that Scottish rugby is, like anything could happen. You know, <laughs> like stranger things have happened. So like we aren't doing anything crazy. We are sticking to the process. <laughs> like no trick shots just do your job and let's just close this thing out you know no trick shots i like the fact that it sounds like some of you discussed the trick shot you're like no trick shots guys i don't care no <laughs> well, trick shots. I, always, I always joke about it in like in warm-up or in training like on the toe and everyone's like cb you gotta stop yeah. like, okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. cb your front row the mantra is run straight and if there's somebody in the way run through that person that is yeah yeah faces not spaces exactly i like i'm I might get that tattooed on me. That's quite inspiring. Mm. Faces not spin. None of this run at arms, straight for shoulder. Yeah, exactly. Straight for shoulders. All right. Well, I've got ahead of myself talking about the World Cup qualifier because we're coming back to that because that was a good bit of feel. That was a good afternoon for me on a Friday. Got the Skype two hours of work because some genius put it on at 3 p.m. UK time. I was like, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Office was quiet and I was like, BBC, BBC I player in the background. Joys of yeah. a second screen. So talking back, you're getting those first caps in South Africa. How does that, how was that moment when like the name gets called? Obviously, I think, did you come off your bench your first cap? You came off the bench your first yeah. cap, didn't you? Yeah, for yeah. both, for my first two. Yeah. 
more than that, I think. But so, but how did that feel? Because it's almost, <laughs> it's almost in a way it's a bit more special because when you run out as a team, you run out as Scotland fifteen. But yeah, you know, when you come on as a sub, somebody screams your name. It's like making their debut. Yeah, CV, <laughs> and yeah. you're just kind of like, yes, that's that's me. Like, did you? How did those emotions compare? Do you mean like in my first cap versus the qualifier? No, just like your first cap in general. Like how did those emotions like general. come across to you? Yeah. <clears throat> in my first cap, I was shitting myself. I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. It was unreal. I don't even think like I only got I my first cap I had I think like maybe five minutes. And I knew that, which was fine. Like it's like, you can't screw that much up in five minutes. And I didn't think I would, like, you know, you do all your homework, you've gone through the reps, like you know what you need to do, you know, you need to like where you need to be. But I think, I'm, I mean, regardless of like, you're an anxious person or not, it's still that first thing that you've never done before. So my heart was beating out of my chest. I thought I was going to be sick. I like, don't even think I heard anything. I think I genuinely blacked it out because I was so nervous. It was wild. So yeah, I don't even know if my first cap, I remember it really like, because it was relatively short, which is absolutely fine. Because my nerves were like, like every part of my senses. Um, I, yeah, I think the biggest thing that I remember from that match isn't even playing, but was when I was on the bench and listening to the crowd behind us, because we were mm -hmm. in South Africa, it was like a completely different energy. You had people who were like playing music and singing and dancing and clapping. Like it was, I remember like turning around, like watching the girls play and then turning around being like, this is an experience that so few people get to have. Like that, I think that is really what like has sunk in more from that first match rather than like anything that actually happened on the pitch. Because like after the second half, like when the second half started happening, I was like, I might go out. I might not like, no, there's no guarantees in our team, whether you're right. on the bench or not, you still might not see the pitch. And that's all part of like being a part of the squad. But I was like, no, I could be going out. I might not be. But as time was ticking down, like the probability of me going on became higher if I was going to be going on because I knew that they would give me a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really remember anything that happened on the pitch, but everything else <laughs> was really good. <laughs> I, remember, I remember reading the ground. I just didn't recognize myself as a player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like that was an outer body experience. <laughs> See, because, because I know you know, I've seen on social media, I can just imagine you, I just imagine you sit on this bench sort of dancing along with the crowd. Oh, it's so good. Cause, yeah. Cause I watch like, all the African sports and I have like, like you said, the, the crowd's a party. You, you pay tickets to go to a party with sport going on in the middle of the party. Yeah. So yeah. I can just imagine you just, so sort of dancing, I'm like, this is great. And then some like, CB one off, like, oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to hang with my friends. Yeah, yeah no, it was, it was very, very cool. That's nice. So, okay, we'll, we'll try and get to a game you remember. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect to have to ask that question. That was, I came across a little more constantly than meant to be, that's sorry about that. Uh, what, was your first game, what was your first game like at home in Scotland? Do you remember that with the Scottish game? That was the Japan game. So it's like the first one at home you actually got to play actually been able to play in, yeah, that I actually was like – because so I've been selected for some autumn tests, but I never actually got played. So the first game that I got to play at home would have been the one in Japan, or not the one in Japan, the one against Japan in November, which was the best. Like, I need, I need, was, to, I need to change my need, resource website because that's wrong. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the first time, or maybe, yeah, in front of a crowd at least. Like, we played France. But I don't think that was a crowd yet because that was when COVID. Yeah, I, I had it written down that you played France at home, so I knew it to France. I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't like, I mean, playing France in Glasgow was great, but like no one was there. So it wasn't yeah. really, it, it was a closed doors match. But the one um, just recently against Japan was very special because obviously we had a home crowd, like loads of my clients came, my mom was there. Like that was the first time I got to see my mom in like two and a half years. So to have her, that was the first time she got to see me play for Scotland. Like, so that was really special. Obviously we got the win. We worked really hard for that. Like it was a convincing win, especially into the second half. Um, I got to start, like I was like, I felt confident in my position at this point. Cause I've been playing tight head for a while. So I think that was probably one of my favorite matches just because as a squad, we did really well, but like, I also had so many personal things that were, just so good about it. Like being out on the pitch and like hearing some of my clients literally screaming at me. I'm like, this is so cool, you know, because 
I think I heard them. I was there and I just yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were not quiet. They are not quiet. They're so good. Um so yeah, I think that, that was that was one of my favorite memories for sure. That's it. What was it? What was your mum like when she was watching you? She still she's still watching so you sing the Fire of Scotland. <laughs> she is still so scared watching me play. Her mem- like her first memories of watching me play are like when I'm in high school, I'm like horizontal tackling someone. She tells that story all the time. And I'm like, well, that's just like that is contact sport. Like yeah, that, that's that's my little girl breaking yeah, the half there. Yeah. <laughs> like I went from this like shy kid to absolutely like shoulder barging people, not actually because I don't get red cards, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, so she's literally nervous watching me but I think she was just so proud you know like and it was just so special to have her there like I think she knew how special it was for me as well so it was like really good that we got to share that experience together like even having her in Scotland was super special and she got to see me do this thing that I obviously care so much about and has given me so much opportunity that it was just like yeah, I came off and like I remember like being like, "Where is she?" And like, "Hi, mom." And we had a little wave, and yeah, you, like you hear everybody in the crowd like kind of have like a little giggle about it. But like, I waited so long for her to be able to come and see me play. It was yeah. very, very special. Yeah, nothing cooler than sitting at your mom playing a professional game of rugby. Yeah, yeah, being able to like wave up to her in the stands, like. So- if I- if I, if I managed to play for Scotland, even if I was in Murray, a full Murray field, I'd still manage to pick her out. I'd give it such big licks if my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very special. But yeah, because we sit in the nosebleeds as well. So if I managed to pick up my mom, that'd be you know, <laughs> awesome. yeah. We don't get the good seats you guys got at the last game. We, I was better view, of, better, better view of Edinburgh than I had a better view of the game. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> but so right, so back to the back to the game. So you've got your, you've got the Japanese crowd, all the players that, and you talked about the game quite well. You said that the second half you sort of turned it around. Does that does your mindset change during a game? So like you said, it got a bit close going into half time, and then did you just when it's in the change room and stuff like that in a close game is there somebody that sort of speaks up and says everyone needs to get their head in gear is it uh everybody stare at the floor for 10 minutes and talk to yourself to get yourself in a mindset no it's definitely like we we have to talk as a team so mm-hmm. like we split into forwards and backs and kind of talk because obviously like we're all playing the same sport but we're playing different sports within it like forwards have a different job than backs do so we split and talk about like our respective kind of spaces whether that's like our set piece um, and then like backs talk about, I have no idea what they talk about. Um, but we'll put the pose when they score the try, yeah, right? what, 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 what dance we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, don't know. I have no idea what they do. They do a good job. I don't know what they talk about. Um, but yeah, so we talk about like our own kind of stuff and then we'll talk attack defense, sort of what is going well and what's not going well and what we need to change. Um, and obviously you also, you do just have those like small conversations within players. So if I'm often in a pod with Jade, for example, we'll maybe talk about, okay, like if you tighten up a little bit on that tip or whatever, like it's definitely on those spaces are there. Like, so you have those individual conversations. So like those little bits are in your brain going into it. But um, then you also just, we obviously have our coaches kind of talking as well because they can see the whole thing and they sort of reinforce the plan moving forward. Like what's not working, what is working. You need to stop throwing shit. You need to start (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, just like, it's all the, it's all the stuff that we know, but having it come from one person who's kind of in charge is helpful, you know? Um, But yeah, I definitely, there, like when you first come into the change room, it is about like, we do have a couple minutes of just like breathing, like just sit down, grab a drink, like collect, like, cause you, you do have to kind of get your energy back into the right headspace. Cause obviously when you're out there, there's so much adrenaline, like you're go, 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 like, you're kind of all over. So then you kind of have to come back down to earth so that when you have those conversations, it actually sinks into your brain and you can move forward like logically. Otherwise I don't think any conversation after that would be helpful. Um, yeah. So it's well managed. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't get like hot and heated in the changing room at a half time for Scotland well, women. I don't think so. Like, I mean, that's not to say that we've definitely haven't had, um, <laughs> is, i can sense i can sense a media train co- answer coming out no, no 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 not at all like i'm just like because we've never been like rinsed you know what i mean we've yeah. never had a coach come in and be like you're shit but like that has never happened because yeah. when is that ever going to be productive but like we definitely have had conversations where it's like we deserve to be spoken to like that like but it's not ever mean it's just sort of like what you're 
Like we don't play like this. You know, it's just a stern talking to. It's almost like I'm not yeah. mad. I'm just disappointed. Like that's the kind of vibe. I'd rather somebody was mad at me to be fair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> somebody said this, I'd be like, I'd be like, no, shoot, yeah. I'm disappointed too. Like, yeah, um, but we know we've never ever like been. Cause, yeah, that's the thing. I don't want it to come across like we've ever been like rinsed like that. Because I know sometimes, mm-hmm. especially, I don't know, I don't know if it happens in the men's game, but like whenever you see any like movies about sports if something's going wrong the coach comes in and throws something and screams and shouts like that has never happened at all because that's like so counterproductive but we definitely have had conversations where it feels like dad is mad at you and just (laughs) disappointed and you're like but it's all warranted because we we ourselves know that when we have those conversations or when we are basically called out for bullshit that we're doing like if you aren't making your tackles if you aren't like fronting up and set piece like these are the things that we know that we can do so get your shit together because like you wouldn't be here if you couldn't do that thing so i don't know what you need to do to get that together but you need to do it (laughs) do you just have like that that in between us moment from will where it's like well that was fucking dreadful and then you yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. I think you should just have like you should just have that ready as like a little clip in case you are having a bad game and you just need motivation to rise. Just sit quietly and just play it, and then everybody has like a good chuckle. Like, like, right, let's go do it again. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because I know, especially knowing your team and like your collective, like togetherness as a team, that would do nothing but raise morale. Like nobody would get annoyed at that either. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing as well. Is like our team is like genuinely like so close knit, and so like having those tough conversations or like kind of calling out bullshit, which doesn't often happen because we usually fix the problem at the source. Like if something doesn't go to hand if or if something happens, like we'll put our hand up if we've made that error or we have that conversation on the pitch. So we don't have to come in and play the blame game. We don't have to come in and like call that shit out because we all take responsibility, responsibility for our action um, and know that if something is getting brought up, like, oh, well, you should have been here or you like, that's not how we yeah. trained it or whatever. Like it's not coming up like from a place of like personal attack. It's coming from a place of like, we all want to be better as a collective and we like, we're here for the team. It's yeah. So it's much easier to have those conversations. That sounds like a team I'd like to be a part of. Yeah. I you mean, wish. there's a lot, a lot of limits. <laughs> I was gonna say there's a lot of limitations stopping me from being part of that team, but yeah. guys, yeah. guys, guys can dream. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked about it nicely and i want to talk about the world cup qualifier not just the 80 minutes i want to talk about the two because you were there for two weeks weren't you in qatar mm. yeah dubai qatar dubai dubai, dubai. i get them confused all the time it's yeah. so bad it's, it's it sounds so inconsiderate that i get them confused every time but it's generally just my brain cannot that <laughs> just will not allow me to differentiate the two for whatever reason it just goes qatar dubai qatar dubai, qatar, dubai. yeah I'm not racist is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think people think I am, but I'm no. trying to signify that. So you talk about the togetherness of the team. How did that feel to actually get all of you as a group? Because after, like you said, the two years of COVID and then you got together as a group and obviously there's still some restrictions, but it must have felt a bit like, because you're obviously the first game that you're meant to have got cancelled. Did yeah. it feel like a bit like a, not quite a girl's holiday because you're there with a purpose, but you're just like, there's a sense of normality about this. Did it feel quite good? um yes but it was very funny because like the number one thing that we talked about and that our coaches talked about it was like this is not a holiday <laughs> <laughs> if i hear you say we're holiday we're gonna have a problem <laughs> which is fair because like although like yeah we're all going to this new place in the sun get to train with your friends like it can feel like a holiday but like we all knew that we had a job to do um yeah. so it was fun though just to kind of in the first week like just take the stress off a little bit as well you know we we'd already done all the hard work that was the biggest thing as well i think we've been preparing for this match or well at first matches but then obviously just that match for years like we thought this qualifying thing was going to happen ages ago and then it like everything's been bumped around so often because of covid like it got to the point where when we finally got to dubai we're like oh my gosh we're finally actually here like let's just get this show on the road like we are we are well cooked we are seasoned like we are ready to be served we cannot wait to get out there so it didn't feel stressful at all which was such a different experience than i think we've ever had before as a squad because more often than not, like we are preparing and stressing and analyzing and like, and obviously we're still doing all those things, you know, we're still training, we're still going through all the reps, we're still doing all the simple stuff 
all the time, but it just felt like with a little bit more ease because we'd already done all of that hard work. So it did sometimes feel like maybe we were on holiday because we got to like have some afternoons off and like sit in the sun, but like we, we were still very much like focused on getting the first things first, just done, yeah. you know? Yeah. Work, work first, play second. Exactly. And then <laughs> we did play quite hard. So <laughs> Good. I, I've seen the photos. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you become a spike ball convert then? Cause that's all I, I have ball. always, no, I love spike ball. I didn't really play much when I went away. Um, because I'm not great at it. And so it seems like I, a mandatory skill. It seems like passing the rugby ball in the Scottish national team. You've got to be able to play spike you're ball. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. But the last time I played was when I was in Glasgow. Um, and so it'd be me and like Lou and Maz and then Tyrone. Cause you like, sometimes there's only like the four of us mm -hmm. in Glasgow training session. So this would have been like before I moved to Loughborough. So we'd have like morning sessions and that's how we'd warm up. And Tyrone would always be my partner. Um, mm -hmm. And he and I took some time <laughs> to warm into the match and we are very similar. So we butt heads a lot. So the communication <laughs> not always good so louise and maz would absolutely rinse us in matches but then like by like the fifth game we would start to like have comebacks um tyrone would always blame it that like his back hurt or he couldn't reach her because he didn't want to pull a hammy or whatever but um <laughs> i like how he's still doing this might make him pull a hammy he's I, listen, <laughs> I don't want to shoot any more shots at the poor man okay he's not going to no, but he, um, yeah, so that's probably the, like the last time I played. And then when you, when we went to Dubai, it's like all the sevens girls playing who like play together all the time and like are way more a agile and be just coordinated than I am. You know what I mean? Like you guys can do all the quick stuff and I'll do all like the heavy lifting. You know, we have just different... turns them to a calf raise. That's what you do. Exactly. We have a raises, different so. set of skills. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, I would usually just let them, let them do their thing and I would just kind of hang out and chat, chat shit mostly. That's, it's a social sport. Yeah. It's like darts or pool, social sport. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So how did it feel getting up to the, I want to talk to you about your experience of the shirt handing out, because I've heard they're quite an emotional, yeah. it's quite an emotional room when those shirts are getting handed out to people. Yeah. Because do you have an idea of if you're starting before that or do you generally not have a clue until yeah, so we do get the team sheet before sure prez. So that does right. help. Yeah. Um, but they still it doesn't make it any less like emotional. Are you are you are you a crier? I've heard a few. Oh my god, I am like the biggest crier. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like I something nice happens and it doesn't even have anything to do with me and I will cry. Like so as soon as so basically what happens is we come into our room and like Brian will kind of chat a little bit and then he'll usually, cause it's, so, it's someone different every time presenting the yeah. shirts. Um, and so obviously everybody that gets selected to present our shirts has a special role within our squad. Cause often it's a different me like management member or someone else. And so yeah, whenever they're selected and you find out who it is, like most of us are just sitting there like <laughs> just trying, <laughs> either trying to fire. Like if you're like me, literally just like single streams of tears. <laughs> Because it's just so nice. Like people just like the people in that room just care so much about us and we care so much about them. Like we are genuinely a family. So um yeah, I cry basically every time. It's it's a journey. <laughs> I'm s so, I sound I sound so like I'd love to try to explain that to somebody who doesn't know what rugby is. Like imagine especially in a place like Dubai, like if somebody was just to walk past the room and be like Oh, I think we're in this conference room. Is you guys getting your shirts? And this, this is Brian talking to a woman, woman like a room of women crying. It's like, uh, are you guys okay? Exactly. So, how was the day before the the qualifier? Was there like a lot of nerves in camp, or was it, like you said it was quite calm the week before? But is hmm. it is it the usual steady rise of nerves, or were you just kind of I'm determined yeah. to stay at this level to not pick up the occasion? Well, I think obviously like everybody is different, so. Um, personally, I like to keep it chill until we have to go out and warm up or even after warm up. Like I almost like to pretend that we're not even playing a match of rugby until it's happening because otherwise I can, my body will like the thought of going out and playing my body like releases every ounce of adrenaline and then I can't sleep. You know what I mean? Like there are times 
that I was lying in bed when we were in Dubai, like three days before the match, and I would start thinking about playing and I would look at my watch and my heart rate would go up to like 95. And I'm like, I'm laying down. It's 3 a.m. Like, this is not, but it wasn't nerves. It was like, I was just so excited. Um, and I think like that was different from previous matches just because we did feel so prepared. And I think, I think I genuinely can speak for most of the squad when I say like that was the feeling within camp. Like this one was different with, because we obviously got to see Colombia and Kazakhstan play each other. So we had a good idea of what that looked like. We knew our roles. Like we knew what we had to do. Um, we knew that we had already put in the work. You, you also know, like there's no amount of sessions now that are going to change anything for the squad moving forward. You know what I mean? Like we could train five times in three days before the match, but those sessions, like you're not going to get anything more from them. We've already done all the work. So um, uh, the day before and the day, cause we obviously, we didn't actually kick off until like 7 PM in Dubai. So mm -hmm. that was the hardest part. Like eating is always the hardest part for me. And I know for a lot of the girls, because you're trying to manage your nerves in those moments. Um, but like this one felt different because we just felt prepared. So it was a lot of less nervous energy and more like excitement that was also trying to be managed right. because you you don't like, you don't want to get up too high too early because then you genuinely tire yourself out. So it's just about like, almost like not talking about it at all until like 5 PM. <laughs> it must've been a very weird breakfast. It was, oh my God. <laughs> weird breakfast, weird lunch. Like throughout the day, I wasn't really like, I was feeling fine. But then the second I had to eat something, I was like, I can only eat pancakes. Like, I don't want anything with any flavor. Like, I have no appetite. It was very weird. Um, it's crazy. But, yeah. I love, I love the stuff you guys all try to make small talk. Like, so, uh, plans <laughs> tonight? And they're like, oh, we're a qualifier, nothing. I still some telly after, who knows? Just get yeah. through the day. Yeah. You no, know, you, just, you just end up talking about, like, so much random crap. Or, like, Yeah. I honestly couldn't even tell you because you're most like you, everybody knows that they're just trying to like fill the air yeah. or, or sometimes it'd be like, you'd eat and then like have like a little bit of small talk for like five minutes. Be like, okay, anyways, I'm just going to go up to my room. Cause you can't like be around other people. Whereas yeah. like other people had to be around other people. So just like managing your energy, um, for what best suited you, I guess. I, I, I can't, I've never been in that situation. I have no idea how I'd respond, but sounds like yeah. you handled it very well the results yeah. shows that you handled it very well yeah we did our best we definitely did our best <laughs> you try it that's yeah give it, give it the good old college try mm -hmm. um i want to talk about has because you were obviously considered favorites going into that game like i think it'd be quite fair to say that scotland were considered the favorite out of the three teams to qualify yeah. Yeah. did that add a bit of pressure that scotland aren't necessarily used to yeah. Get, very, get very rugby on this podcast for a sense. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I think like it um, was sort of like a blessing and a curse, you know, like yeah. um, it was great to know that we were coming in and people were actually giving us some credit that we deserve. We've worked so hard and we did deserve that. Like we have been performing, we have been taking away wins from our matches. Like we are building as a squad and that should be noted. And that's something that we take a lot of confidence in. But then also you're absolutely right on the flip side. You're like, oh shit, like people are, are noticing now, like we're doing something. Like, so, um, there was definitely, there was definitely pressure on it, but again, like when you focus less on that pressure or perceived pressure and more on doing the shit that we can control, it took that pressure off, you know, like we can only do what we can do. So let's just focus on that. And that made it easier. That sounds textbook good answer. I like that. Just It's honest though. It is honest. Good. No, that's what I mean. It's a very good answer. It's just, yeah. this is what we do. We're just going to get on with it. Yeah. So we've spoke about the game. We spoke about the fact that you were tempted to do up and under trick shots. <laughs> when that final whistle went and you spoke about all day about playing down the emotions. How were the emotions as soon as the final whistle went? And you're like, there's physically, it's physically impossible for them to win now. We have one. Yeah. How did that feel? It's just relief, you know? Like, it was just relief. It was like, we, it's done. Like, we finally did it. Like, it, yeah. I think, um, 
because I knew some of the, like I roomed with Sarah Law and she's been on this journey for much longer than I have. Mm -hmm. And so as much as it's like very special for me, like this whole opportunity being a part of this is incredible. Like I almost felt it more for her because we spoke about it throughout the week and, um, and for Jade and for like Waz and for all these girls who've been in the squad for so much longer and have even been through the first like world cup cycle that they didn't qualify for. And like, I think that was the biggest thing was like, I was so excited. I was like, Oh my God, we're actually doing it. Like, this is crazy. Like we finally did it. Like hey, gave Louise a big hug and um, right out and saw the other girls. But I think the biggest thing for me was like, I was just so proud of everybody. And I just was so like excited for slaw, especially because again, we just spent the whole week together and I knew how much this meant to her. And so I just, I just like, that's what I felt most of was like pride for her and like really excited to be able to be a part of that alongside those girls was like the biggest thing. She must have been cool as ice after that kick against Ireland. Oh I, I, reckon, I reckon nothing's phased her since like 2019. <laughs> you would think that, but we were late to the buses to the airport and she broke her cool, her cool streak. I won't, <laughs> we won't talk about that too much, but the people who know, know. So yeah, um, yeah no, she is literally like one of the coolest people of all time. So yeah. And then how was the celebrations after when you got back to Scott? You had quite an early flight after your celebration. Pardon me. Yeah. So um, in Dubai, they were very, like, we didn't really have much going no. on just because of when the game finished, when our flights were um, basically like the setup of like with alcohol in Dubai anyways. And honestly, most of us were like, we know we have a big day out tomorrow. Like, let's just get <laughs> our things together. Like get the three hours of sleep that are available to us because I'm on this flight. Um, but yeah, when we got back to Scotland, it was well earned <laughs> i i would have because i hope gregor townsend's two two glasses of wine rule wasn't in play there i hope it was a bit more it was something else <laughs> that's that's code for we're not going to talk about what happened i was one over <laughs> for about five days it was wild <laughs> that sounds, that sounds like a i guess also when you go from not drinking like at all for a long time to drinking it was also just the like the hours of drinking that we did. You know what I mean? It goes back to like day drinking. We did start quite early because we were at the men's game. And then we, there was no, like no one napped. No one did anything. We went out and stayed out until the lights came on. So, um, right. yeah. How did you manage the walk around Murrayfield at halftime? Have you been drink how long have you been drinking for by then? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why everybody was like linking arms? It's just like one person's just dragging the rest on you like, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah no i think by that time we were still like relatively tame which was good um because again it was a marathon not a sprint you know what i mean it would yeah. have been very easy to sprint into it but i think we all knew like there's a bigger picture here so i reckon espresso martinis must have been consumed quite a lot like I did have a couple, yes <laughs> <laughs> i did participate in a few of those <laughs> right so lastly you've mentioned it a few times and i want to talk about because she did go viral a wee bit during last year's six nations Okay. Mama, C Mama CB, she went. She went viral a wee bit. Oh, you know? the angel, yeah. Yeah. How is it? How is it when your mum's getting? I was going to say like when your mum's getting brought up in all these circles with famous people, and then you've got Maggie Alfonsi tweeting, yeah. retweeting. Was it like when you're seeing your name and like your mum's face and your mum's name being thrown into these circles on Twitter? You like something? Something's changed right now. It's no, no. It just feels so weird, you know? Because like, I mean, it is insane. Like, um having all of that like blow up um but you almost feel like um you're also a viewer to it like <laughs> like it's not really your mom <laughs> yeah like well i mean nothing's different with me you know what i mean like it is crazy like that that tweet had like insane amount of engagements and retweets whatever and obviously like people talk about it and know who my mom is which is that's the weird part it's like you don't know deb like stop but um I mean, mom, I, your mom. Yeah. Yeah. like but i'm glad that everybody knows her because she's genuinely like the best person of all time um but yeah it just kind of feels like you're watching it like in the third person because like nothing's really different you know like you blow up with one tweet um but then like you still i don't know walk to the grocery store nothing's changed you know like you're not all of a sudden this like mate like famous person but um, yeah, I mean, my mom is famous and I hope one day that I can get her autograph. So <laughs> has your mom, has your mom been recruited by TikTok for the Six Nations yet? Is she gonna oh my God, people to... no way. Like I, you she can only... have that one for free TikTok. You, you comment the podcast and you can have that one for free. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If I managed to somehow get her on TikTok, I don't even know what would happen, but she just only recently got Instagram and I don't think she, she doesn't really know how to use it. She only has it so she can like look at my stories. <laughs> <laughs> so she's such a mom and dad thing. <laughs> yeah. Like she's so sweet. She's like, cause I'll tell her about Instagram and I've told her to get it before. Cause I'm like, that's where I post all my pictures like that. Cause I'll, I'll like post a picture or something on Instagram. And then I'll also just send it to her via WhatsApp. Yeah. Um, but then she wants to just see it as it happens. So she's only recently got Instagram, but like, I don't think she knows that she can post things too. Like she's not that great at social media and because like no one's shown her how to use it. Yeah. So that might be a, a project. If I get to go home in the summer and see her, then we can work yeah. on it. But get, yeah. Get your mom's social media trains. Just, yeah. <laughs> I reckon mom CV's Instagram would take off. Like, I agree. As long as, as long as she doesn't do what the mom thing is, which is just, take a photo there and then like not aim it angle it around just take the phone go there you go because then... okay well that is exactly her brand so <laughs> <laughs> uh, live action there's no no, no fakeness on mama cv's instagram profile. yeah exactly no filters yeah. no fake. it's exactly what live it loud and in charge <laughs> yeah just get that as the buy that sounds yeah. something cringy that sounds like live laugh love oh that's <laughs> I feel a bit ill saying that yeah. <laughs> so last thing i want to talk about cv you spoke about how you were quite shy and anxious when you were growing up and that how do you have not how do you have, but how do you maintain such a positive outlook on life? Because it's, it's generally quite inspiring. I think you've even, I think I tweeted you as a massive fanboy a couple of years ago and saying, you know, like be more like CV because it's very positive. So how do you manage to keep that sort of attitude? Um, I think practice, honestly. Like I think it is very easy to allow yourself to feel beaten up sometimes. And sometimes that's how you have to feel like it's, it's super easy to um, say that I am super positive and feel good all the time, but as an anxious person, although most of the time I am this person that you see here now and are talking to, that anxiety doesn't just go away. Like that is what it is. So there are still definitely days where you kind of feel it creep up on you and, it, and it's a crap day. Like you just feel tired, you feel run down, you... Um, don't really want to engage with anyone. You don't want to participate in conversations. You just kind of want to sleep. Um, and that's just like what anxiety ha is for me. Like that's how it presents itself for me. And sometimes it also means that I'm overthinking a lot of things. Like I can feel this like wheel nonstop turning, but I think as I've gotten older, I've understood that that's just sort of a part of who I am. And when it happens, acknowledging that it's okay to feel like that and it will pass. But there are also times where it is super easy to have a situation happen and immediately want to um, take like the more negative route around it, like, or how you see it. But I just think like the energy that you spend on feeling shit or talking poorly about yourself or about, about your situation or whatever it is, like that's also energy that you could be using to shift that dialogue in your brain, you know, like, when it comes to injury or when it comes to opportunity or when it comes to your job or your life or whatever. Like, I think also because I talk about this with my clients all the time, that's my dialogue. Like, so I'm lucky because I am talking about it all the time. So I'm more frequently talking about how to shift your brain into being more positive than to be negative. So that's like what I have going on all the time. But I just think like, if you take something like, um, maybe you have like a knee injury or something, you still have a working leg and two arms and you can still do so many things. Like just because you've got one negative setback doesn't mean your entire life is closing on you. Um, so I just think like it is a practice, like, but it's also recognizing that there are going to be like shit days as well and allowing that to happen and not like beating yourself up about it because life is a journey like and that sounds like super hippie or whatever but like it that is what it is like no one is going to run at 100 all the time so being able to like take your foot off the gas and like sit in your feelings sometimes is super important because it means that you can feel the lows when you need to but you also can kick yourself in the butt if you need to like get yourself out of the slump and like also obviously having like people around you that do lift you up on those days as well is super important but um I think like having a positive outlook on life and feeling the way that I do 95% of the time comes from 
actively practicing choosing to be like this because it's just as easy to feel shit if I wanted to. I did. I did, don't think anybody could have put that better. That was that was genuinely really inspiring. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was really inspiring, and I hope somebody listens to that and can take it and put it into practice. Yeah, it well, is. It's just a practice. It is. Well, ending on that inspirational note, you've now <laughs> conquered the main body of the podcast. So hopefully that this car crash of a podcast wasn't too stressful for you. No, all good. I've had fun. Good. I'm glad. Well, you might not have to this next one. <laughs> so, speaking of car crashes, you have now reached the soon to be famous under the team bus section. Maybe copyrighted from other shows, but we don't talk about that. We don't tag them. They never know. Okay. So similar to the quick fires. First name that comes into your head. So I'm going to ask you a question and you pick the first teammate that you think of. Okay. So nice and easy to start off with. Who's the most determined player you've ever played with? I actually thought Rachel Malcolm was the first person that came into my brain. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. But then I, well, I was, I was going to overthink it, but that's the first name and I, I stand by that. She is very determined. That's quite El Capitano at least from the front. Yeah, totally. Right. Who's the biggest practical joker in the changing room? Oh my God. I would say either Louise McMillan or Rona Lloyd. And they were roomies one time and they're the worst influence and the best influence for each other. But I love them both. <laughs> I think Hannah said Louise McMillan. So this clearly yeah. must be some, there's, there's no smoke without fire. I think she's the, the youngest sibling and it shows, you know, she's a little <laughs> Indian, but I love her. <laughs> At least you're honest. Who's yeah. the most clumsy? Who's the most clumsy person in the squad? Nelly. Oh my God, Nelly. And I only noticed this since I've lived with her in Loughborough. <laughs> she is like, for being such a talented athlete, she literally is the most clumsy person. <laughs> the other day when I was down in Loughborough, she tripped over the wall and fell over. And like, I genuinely think she almost got a concussion. Did you Did you say tripped over a wall? Yeah, it was like a small wall right. like, in her backyard. <laughs> right. You, you should have prefaced that. I was like, yeah, over, yeah, like, yeah. A wall. Just these really big steps. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, probably Nelly. She's it. Yeah, that's only something I've recently noticed. Right, who is most up for a night out? Um, whew, probably can't, can't me. Your, I was gonna say you can't <laughs> see yourself after your, your big night out. Then Maz, then Mary McDonald. I think like Fair yeah, enough. it wouldn't take much to get her out. <laughs> I, th I think the young guns will come and take over as soon as they seem like they're yeah. yeah, they do love a night as well. Right. Who's got the most out out there fashion sense? Who comes to who comes up in the wildest bits of kit and you think, where did you get that? Maybe like maybe it's not wild, but I think the first person I thought of would be like Evie Wells. And it's not like bits of kit at training, but like when we go on nights out, she because, because she is a young gun. Maybe I just don't understand fashion anymore. She always looks great, but I'm like, these are things that I would have never thought of. So what we talking? What we talking? What wild? I don't know. I don't know if it's even wild, but it's like our fashion sense is always just combos. Different. Yeah, just different combos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she looks great. Yeah. Fair. Who is the best dancer in the squad? Who is the best? Jenny Maxwell. Definitely. Can she cut shapes? Yeah, she can cut some shapes. Nice. And vice versa, who's the worst dancer in the squad? Who's the person that you wish didn't cut shapes? Slash kind of want them to cut shapes because it's hilarious to watch. <laughs> Jade Conkle. <laughs> She's not actually, but it's funny to roast her. So Jade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't. I know I know Emma Wassels just to get a jail free answer now because everybody said that in season one. So yeah. I'll, I'll push you for an answer in case you're not being truthful. Who's the future coach? Who's somebody that you just think they love rugby so much that they will be a coach before the day is done? I don't think that they'll actually be a coach before the day is done, but I think that they would be a really good coach and it would be Sarah Law. I think she's got like so much to offer in terms of like experience and like just how, like she just knows so much. Like every conversation I have with her, I always learn something. So <laughs> her or Nelly, which is classic because they're both like tens, but um yeah, either of them. That's a good answer, though. That's a great answer. Who is hard as nails? Who's somebody, if you were to get in a fight in a rugby pitch, you're like, I hope they're standing behind me when I throw this first punch? Evie Gallagher. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if she, well, I feel like Gal would have my back. Yeah. 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 There we go. Okay, so following on from that, who's the most natural athlete you've ever played against? Like, who's somebody that's just like, you're a machine? Like, maybe not the best rugby player, but just a brick shit house. Um, well, do you mean break shitheads or do you mean just athlete? Because like the first, like well, okay, yeah. like an insane athlete. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like 
how does someone run that fast? Mm -hmm. I will never know, but I guess, so for backs, I would say Rona for forwards. I would say, Oh, um, honestly, like maybe Rachel McLaughlin because she's small, but Gal can like dump some people. You know what that I mean? Was, that was my that was my answer when I because yeah. when I I always write, write every question with an expected answer to see yeah. if it's a good question or not, and that came up. Yeah. So, God, we look us. We know rugby, don't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who is the most gullible in the squad? Who would fall for anything? Rona Lloyd, easily. <laughs> Oh my god! Sometimes you I like, that so I, fast. <laughs> sometimes I try to have like a little bit of banter, and then I have to remind her I'm just kidding. It's yeah. just easy. Oh, that's that's almost a shame of that, but you kind of feel bad. Like, oh, I'm I sorry. Say, yeah, yeah. I would say Rona Lloyd or Tyrone. He's yeah. also very easy to wind up and like Ty- Tyrone with the glass hamstrings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the broken back. Yeah, <laughs> spike ball is a dangerous game. Never mind rugby. It is. It is. Right. This one I thought of especially for you. Who had the toughest accent to understand when you first started to get to grips with Scottish It's going to be either the girls, well, I mean, any of the girls from the borders. So it'd be Lana or Chloe. Uh, Tomo is fine. Tomo, I can mm. understand more. But like, I remember when at first meeting like Lana and Chloe, I was like, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> so <laughs> Chloe's, Chloe's white, isn't she? Is she yeah. She's white. white. Yeah, Chloe's white. Lana's Millish? I think I so. It sounds a bit weird, but I, know, I think yeah. I've somewhere i'm i'm in the posh part you're fine she's quick as well but that, i might be lying i just know she's one of the border folk so <laughs> just we just put them down there we just keep yeah. them down there. <laughs> right who is the human turnstile who can't tackle for love nor money who can't tackle who can't tackle for yeah, love yeah who nor can't money? tackle for love nor money <laughs> um i don't know <laughs> who can't tackle for love nor money not in like a mean way, but in like no, I don't know. I don't know. Because I feel like our tackles, we've been hitting like ninety percent. So <laughs> that must make you feel really guilty as the person that misses the tackle when you're bringing that stuff. Yeah, down. yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> I don't know. Can I skip? I feel like we're like I. I'll I give do. you a skip. You've you've had some good answers. I'll give you a skip. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Thank you. <laughs> right. Second last one. Who is more? Who is most likely to order plain at spice level at Nando's? Who can't handle their spice? Lana. Really? Yes. <laughs> it's a horror thing. Yeah. Lana loves a plane. <laughs> you need to educate on that. I get the lemon no, in her. Like, oh. I've been trying. <laughs> We're working right. on She's and last... <laughs> She's getting there. We'll get Yeah. Right. And last but not least, who hogs the mirror the most after a game if they know they've got a nice interview with Sky Sports or Scotland? Emma Warsaw. Hey, that's that's bad. That's that is now four for four on answers for that question with Emma Warsaw. <laughs> <laughs> that is literally four for four. <laughs> then you know we're telling the truth. Well, I feel bad, Emma. I I think you're saying like you're fine. She's, I need to get. Her... <laughs> she's lovely. She absolutely is. But Gal knows what she wants, so it's fine. <laughs> Poor girl. She tries so hard. It's oh. I said I said it's because she puts her like she puts her body on the line. So yeah, totally has to cover <laughs> the black eye. <laughs> That's what mascara is for. Exactly. <laughs> just, just run a smoky eye number and then you're fine. Just play you it You get off. it. You totally get it. Uh, see. Yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I was about, what's the word? I'm a, not an athlete. I'm an affiliate. No, that's the word. <laughs> I forgot the word. It's a master of aesthetic. Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Yeah, yeah. cut it. Makeup artist, MUA, Sam yeah. Matthews, open for business. <laughs> God. All uh, right. Well. You've passed under the team bus. Hopefully, you've not lost any friends in the group chat, and then yeah. you might get a few questions on this day going, "Most gullible, really?" Question mark. Yeah. And then you can be like, "No, it's a joke. It wasn't really you. We just put it in there." Mm. Right. So, CV, before I let you get on with your evening, because I've taken up so much of your time, and I can't thank you enough for coming on. Last question. You've you've just got to the World Cup. You've just had your first big win. You've got three songs to get the team ready for another big seventeen-hour long drinking session. What mm. three songs are you picking, and why? So first song would probably be Run the World by Beyonce, because obviously a bit of power girls. anthem, yeah. Power it's anthem. a power anthem, you get it, totally. <laughs> so that's an easy one. Another one is just one of my personal favorites that I know could get the Glasgow's especially hype. So it'd be X Gonna Give It To You by DMX. That is a song <laughs> nice. that has been played on repeat in the mornings, and it's just like obviously loud music. 
Sometimes that's just the energy you need. And then the last one, it's um, called Rinse and Repeat. It's like a Heads Will Roll remix. Right. But you can only get it on SoundCloud. Rachel McLaughlin showed it to me like a year ago, and it is next level. So those are my three. Anytime you're going on SoundCloud for remixes, you sound like you're going for a big night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those ones where like, like obviously you've got like the Spotify playlist going, and then that's the one song that you want. So you have to actually flip apps, which is a pain in the ass. <laughs> and you have to like watch when Pause. it's going to finish. So there's no gap in sound, but it's worth it every time. Absolutely. Well, that is a cracking way to end the podcast. Three great songs to follow that question. CV, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you on social media to keep up to you with all your adventures? So I've got two Instagram pages. My personal one is itme.cv. And then my business page is Strong Friends Club. Um, those are probably the two easiest ways to find me. I only really show up on Twitter when rugby's going on. Um, and I tweet weird pictures that have been taken of me from training. So that can sometimes be banter. Um, and then I just recently got TikTok. I think my handle is the same, itme.cv or something along those lines. Um, and I sometimes show up there, but Instagram is my, my go-to. So check me out there. Amazing. Well, all links will be down in the top of the description for the videos and on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all the usual. People are coming to the end of the podcast. Thank you very, very much. As usual, please leave us a like rating, give it a thumbs up. Five star reviews, the works, they all help my podcast so much more. The support on season one was genuinely mind blowing for some kids sat in his bedroom trying to pass a lockdown time. But no, thank you guys for helping me grow what it's grown into. Like I said, leave the likes with that. If you're going to be mean on social media, I really don't care that much. It doesn't get under my skin. Just be nice. Constructive feedback is always welcome. I always want to know how I can improve. For example, I got rid of the bed in the background. We now have a wall, so we're getting there. Everybody, thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you guys all again next week with another episode. CB, thank you very much. Bye.